Hey everyone, Archer Shadow here, and welcome back to Cabin Fever. So previously, Mallory and the main character were kind of getting a bit closer together, and we learned more about his life and hers. And yet, something seemed very off about Mallory near the end of the previous video. Anyway, well, I guess it is time to get back to it. Let's see, how many... Yeah, so there's 18 save slots and I've used up 10, so... Alright, well I guess let's get to it, like I said. The fire had burned low, but the inside of the cavern was warm and inviting. I felt a strange sense of calm. Uh, it's so nice in here. I didn't realize how cold I was. I nodded, resisting the urge to remind her about the jacket I had offered every time we went through the door. I could tell she wasn't in the mood for me to poke, at, poke fun at her. Yeah, because like I said, it was very somber. It was getting late, my stomach ached for something to eat, and I was sure she needed something too. How about I heat up something from the freezer? And while we're waiting, we can have tea. It's my turn to make it this time. That sounds nice. She settled herself by the fire, gazing into glowing embers. She seemed a million miles away. I made my way over to the kitchen and filled up the kettle. I almost thought that said fired up the kettle. I took out a container of stew and began the process of thawing it on the stove. I searched in my pantry for a particular jar of loose leaf tea, something I wanted her to try, and waited for the water to boil. When the tea was made, I poured Mallory's into a tacky cat mug my mother had bought at a yard sale once upon a time. Once upon a time, what is this, a furry tale? No. I was glad to see Mallory's eyes light up when I handed her the mug. I guess she would enjoy that kind of thing, though, wouldn't she? Oh my, this is the cutest! Told you. I thought you might like it. Yep, and I was thinking the same thing. I sat by her on the couch. The rain was coming down again, drumming hard on the window. We sat, just listening, sipping our tea. This tea is super yummy. Where did you get it from? Walmart! Okay, no. Walmart probably doesn't exist in this universe. And even if it did, it's probably closed down forever. Phew, I was hoping you'd say that. I actually made it myself. Seriously, what can't this guy make? If you didn't like it, I probably would have told you it was a free sample that came in the mail or something. From a Walmart catalog. You know, I think they actually did used to do catalog at some point. I don't know. Now they probably don't anymore. <laughs> you really made it? Like you grew it in your fish garden? Yeah, how in the world did you make this? Yep. Harvested the tea leaves myself, dried them, tested different blends. I guess in theory it is possible to make your own tea. As Zuko once said in Avatar The Last Airbender, Tea is just hot leaf juice, so, I mean, yeah, I suppose you can. That's amazing. Who taught you all that? So happy. <clears throat> I cleared my throat, a little nervous. My mom did. She was a doctor. But she always had an affinity for herbal home remedies, too. I see. So pretty much your mom was almost like a jack-of-all-trades in a way. Well, at least when it came to this sort of thing. You know, ginger for an upset stomach, honey for a sore throat, antibiotics for an infection. Oh, I don't even remind me of antibiotics. Yeah, I'm still like wincing internally from everything I went through when I had my wisdom teeth taken out. When I was a kid, I didn't know there was any difference. All I knew was that whenever I was sick or hurt, my mom would whip out some drink or salve that made everything better. 
It was like witchcraft. Yeah, she be a witch. Okay, no. But it does seem like everything, every little thing she did was magic. She was really the one who taught me all about plants. How to take care of them. How they can be used. Remembering my mother like this made my throat feel tight. Brought a tear to my eye and a smile to my lips. It was the strangest feeling. Totally bittersweet. That's kind of how I am when I remember my mom sometimes. I guess where with my mom, she was just someone that you would have had to meet to believe. And of course, well, ironic that we're talking about this and it's almost Mother's Day. It is May 6th at the time I'm recording this, so... Yep. Days like those are some of the hardest days for me. Pretty much any day I used to think about where I was celebrating with my mom or just with her. Christmas, birthdays, Thanksgiving, things like that. Mallory's voice softened. Your mother sounds incredible. If she was a doctor, then she probably saved many lives. I suppose she did. I would like to think so. Yes. She and my father both helped save many people. Oh. So you, both of your parents were out there saving people. Gathering the courage to continue talking about them, I took a deep breath and closed my eyes. They both died helping people. Until the bitter end, they tried to save as many lives as possible. Mallory put her hand on top of mine. It was unusually warm, probably as a result of her holding onto the tea mug. They left behind a wonderful person, and you should be proud of that fact. I'm sorry that you lost them. Hearing her kind words nearly sent me into another wave of emotions, but I managed to hold them back. Thanks. So, is it your turn again? I've told you about my parents and my dog, but you haven't told me anything about your family. The only thing we know about her family so far was that she had a sister that she used to play with a lot and they were super close, and that she wanted to go to the planetarium when she was younger. I tried to make my voice sound light and teasing, but really I was serious. I wanted to know her. Well, I still feel like, especially judging from that reaction, it's probably something she's not really too eager to talk about at the moment. Her hand twitched, and for a second I was afraid she would take it away, but she didn't. She just stared at me, and the silence went on so long I felt I had to fill it. Honestly, Mallory, why are you so secretive? Why can't you tell me what you were doing out in the rain that night? I'm not sure if he's exactly being a bit too pushy here, but we'll see. I almost feel like you are kind of laying it laying it on a bit thick there, like you know, like come on, fess up, tell me what were you doing already. Albeit in a much nicer way, mind you, but even still. I just I want to know what brought you to me. I mean, I do too, but I'm just here like, gosh, how do you even handle something so sensitive like this? That did it. She pulled away and sank a little deeper into the couch, looking so sorrowful it hurts. I'm scared to talk about it. Just thinking about it hurts so much. And I'm afraid that if I say it out loud, I won't be able to take the pain. I frowned. I understand. But if you share it with someone who cares about you, then they'll carry some of that pain too. You won't have to shoulder it alone. I suppose when you think about it, it's almost a bit of tough love, as some people might put it. I guess when you consider the fact that I'm very, like, I don't like confrontation or conflict and 
I've always tried to be like very peaceful and caring and I guess sympathetic and attuned to people's emotions even though sometimes I have very difficult times reading other people's emotions. It just makes me feel like, yeah, is that really the right thing to say to her? But then of course, look who's talking, this the same person who has so many issues talking to people that uh yeah, you know, social anxiety is not fun. That someone is me, by the way. In case it wasn't obvious. Really, I thought it was your imaginary friend named Hugo. She smiled softly. I do want you to know me. To know about them. My family. But you still have a lot of... There's just some things you don't feel ready to share, is there? Life was hard, but I loved them so, so much. It was just me, my mom, and my little sister. That was my bubble. We lived in a two-bedroom apartment. We learned to do a lot with the little. Cooking nice meals out of subpar food. Dressing up in old, worn-out clothes. Reenacting our favorite books when we couldn't read because the power was out again and there was no light. Our mom was a factory worker, so she had to go out every day to earn money for us so that we could at least survive. And when she started showing symptoms, they sent her home. She tried to protect us. She stayed in her room, but we still went in, always trying to get her to eat or drink, giving her aspirin to keep down that awful fever. She kept telling us to stop coming in. We called for an ambulance already, but we were still on the waiting list. And what were we supposed to do? Leave her to die alone in her room? A while after my mother died, my father and I had this sort of conversation where I kind of sort of stood up to him after years of him making me feel like my life wasn't worth anything and all the sort of bullying that he did that made me feel like I didn't mean anything and one of the things he told me was how this is basically what I should have done with my mother we didn't have anybody else it was just me and her There was no way that... With all the things going on with her... There was no telling what we could have done different, but... I still wanted to be there for her. And take care of her to the best of my ability. So to that extent... I did not want to leave her by herself, ever. And he basically told me that I should have just walked out on my mother and left her to die. And that made me really angry. So I told him, as civilly as I could, that I was not going to abandon my mother. Not when she needed me, and not when she was... Not when I was all that she had. And that was one of the last times I spoke to my father. So obviously... Mallory and her family obviously had their heart in the right place. My father, not so much. So that's why this kind of just struck a chord with me just now, and I'm just here remembering what he told me. And I'm just here like, I couldn't do that to her. She needed me. There was no way she was going to be able to take care of herself. There were times when she couldn't even get out of bed. She literally needed me. And I was not going to abandon her. So for him 
to tell me that I should have basically abandoned the one person who was always there for me, always raising me up in favor of the one, well, one person who made my life <clears throat> indirectly harder and constantly lowering my self-esteem with his dry humor. You know, like, seriously, who do you think I was going to choose? Anyway, well, let's continue. Well, she did die. My sister was with her when it happened. But I was out in the kitchen making us all something to eat. I can't even remember what it was. A tear ran down Mallory's cheek. By the time it was our turn for the ambulance to come, it was only to take away a body. My sister and I, we didn't know what to do. How were we going to be able to buy food or pay for electricity? We were at the mercy of companies already struggling to produce anything. Factories in the middle of shutdowns due to waves of sickness. And it just seemed hopeless. But, you know, we had learned about people living outside the cities. Smaller communities living off the land instead of trying to survive the old way. We thought, if that was real, maybe we should just leave the city behind. Somehow figure out a way to be like those people. Like you. I nodded. For a long time, I'd wondered why anyone had ever chosen to stay in the cities. Well, in some cases, that was all they had. That was the only option that they did have. Like, I imagine if they could have just gotten up and walked away to live off the land, I imagine they would have done it in a heartbeat, but... That's easier said than done. So sometimes they don't have a choice. And they have to continue living like that as as terrible as it sounds. Eventually I realized not everyone was lucky enough to have inherited an off-grid cabin like I did. Yeah. You know, some people are even now, especially, to get a little bit real, like, it's even hard to find proper housing sometimes. So, I mean, imagine? I couldn't imagine the impossibility of getting started from scratch. Exactly. It would basically be the equivalent of starting all over again, just leaving your life behind and trying to start from ground zero and build up again, but probably not even knowing what the hell you're doing. So in the end, like, for real, what other choice do you have then but to stay there and just try to survive however you can? Mallory gripped the edges of her sweater dress so tightly she trembled. to hang it out on the balcony to dry. And while I did that, she locked me outside. What? I thought it was a prank at first, but she wouldn't let me in, and I got upset. I was banging on the door, yelling at her through the glass to open up. She told me she couldn't because she was sick. She'd started developing symptoms the night before, and she struggled with it all night and all morning. Then finally, I begged her to open the door. She refused. She said there was no safe way for us to stay together. Our mother's attempts to protect us hadn't worked. So my sister decided to take drastic action while she could. She wanted to spare you from getting sick. 
My heart sank like a stone with every word she spoke. She locked you out to save you. Exactly. As cruel as it sounds, she only did that because she didn't want Mallory to get sick. She didn't want her to end up like the mom did. Or possibly how she could have possibly ended up herself. Well, obviously we don't quite know what happened to the sister yet, but... Well, you can only infer, right? Mallory nodded, slowly. We both cried, looking at each other from opposite sides of the glass, while she begged me to go. So, I did. I climbed down the fire escape and just started walking. I wandered along the river and out through the suburbs into the woods. I didn't have anywhere to go, so I just kept on going. Eventually, I was heading up the mountain, totally lost, and that's when I found this place. I wonder then, did this just recently happen in a sense? I shook my head, completely at a loss for words. I never could have imagined that this was her tale. When she first came to me, bleeding and rain-drenched, she'd been bright and kind and helpful. Well, sometimes the saddest people wear the brightest smiles, right? Just so that they can try to escape from the pain and torment that they have inside of them. Then I remembered the quiet little sobs I'd heard after turning my back and the way she sometimes seemed so far away, and I wanted to wrap her up in my arms and hold her so tight that no more grief could touch her. Well, you see what I mean? That's pretty much what she's doing. She's just trying to smile through all the sadness and, you know, be brave. She turned and smiled at me through her tears, and I realized how good she was at putting on that brave, optimistic face. I still think that maybe, somehow, my sister's okay. Maybe she called for help, and they came in time, and found room for her in a hospital ward, and she's fighting right now to pull through. I wonder if this was fate all along. I found you. And you taught me all these things. And we're all going to be just fine. Stunned by her words, I slid off the couch and knelt before her. My body acted on its own. Relieved that she was safe, here with me, I took her hands in mine to reassure her. I think you're right. I think it was fate. Because as much as you needed someone like me, I needed someone like you even more. I felt like I was drowning in her eyes. The rain was beating down outside, roaring louder as gusts of wind sent torrents crashing against the cabin. I felt this closeness with her, and I hungered for more. More talking, more banter, more laughter, more time, more touching, more everything. Through the noise of the rain, I heard the pot of stew I left on the stove starting to bubble. I should check that. Mallory wiped her tears as I got up and returned to the kitchen. The stew had thawed and heated through quite nicely, especially considering I'd left it unattended for so long. Yeah, and you especially don't want to risk burning down the whole cabin, am I right? Imagine how awkward it would have been to serve her burnt food after that whole talk snorted in my brain. Or imagine how awkward it would have been to have burned the whole cabin down. I brought Mallory a bowl. She thanked me. 
We sat and ate and talked a little, the conversation growing lighter as the cabin darkened. The storm kept on and on outside, and as soon as claps of and soon rolling claps of thunder were shaking the sky. Mallory's face grew paler as the noise grew. She set her empty bowl aside and shifted uncomfortably, eyes glistening. It's gone pretty late. I guess we should go to sleep. Perhaps we should. Are you okay? Oh, totally. I just feel a little on edge during storms. That's all. No big deal. It's really, really fine. <laughs> well, I guess we'll see. Okay, well, there's the crank flashlight on the desk over by the door, if you feel like you need some backup light. And you know I'm just upstairs. Good night, Mallory. I climbed upstairs, got undressed, and crawled into bed. I stared at the ceiling as rain pounded the windows beside me, wind howling down over the mountain ridge. I thought about everything Mallory had told me and everything that had happened between us over the past few days. I turned off the light. Slowly, slowly I drifted towards sleep, less and, layer, less, and less aware of the flashes of lightning and booming thunder. I started to dream without fully realizing it, imagining my old house cat, Fidget, had crawled into the, into the bed with me, imagining that my bed was floating on ocean waves. A crack of thunder louder than the rest, and a squeal coming from somewhere very close, woke me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she definitely... The poor thing can't handle storms. Yep, there she is. Mallory appeared at me from beneath my blankets. From beneath my own blankets. For a moment I thought it was a dream, but no, I could feel her there beside me, trembling. I, uh, I'm sorry. I, I lied and I'm not fine. I don't like thunder. I just get so scared. I can't help it. The tremors in her voice were even worse than in her body. I suspected the storm made her a little uneasy, but I had no idea she'd been fighting down this much terror. I sat up, reaching for her, my only instinct to comfort and protect. That's when I remembered I was in my underwear. Maybe she didn't notice. It's okay. It's only noise. It'll be over soon. She nuzzled into me, sniffling. Her face was red. Moisture glistening on her face, her chest. She was sweating and crying, and her, ha and her heart pounded so hard, I could feel it through the mattress. I d don't want to sleep alone t tonight. Okay, it's okay. I stopped short, in disbelief of how much my mindset had changed. How had I gone from refusing to be anywhere near her like this? She was in my bed, and we were breathing each other's air, and I hadn't even checked her temperature. I want to stay with you. She whispered this, touching my hand, her eyes pleading with me. She was so beautiful. All I wanted to do in that moment was kiss her. Oh, damn it! This is one moment where I don't, like, I wish I could just choose the right option, but... Nope, I have to torture myself like this. Okay, well, we're gonna hold back. I decided not to move. Too afraid of ruining this already perfect moment. She had come to me for safety and comfort, and I wanted to give her that. 
or give that to her. Of course, of course you can stay. Get comfortable, okay? <laughs> Let's look at her. She shifted closer to me, resting her head on the pillow next to mine. She sniffled, giving me a soft smile as I stroked her hair. I watched Mallory's eyes fall shut. Her breathing became deep and slow. And though she'd fallen asleep, that little smile never faded. I kept stroking her hair. It felt so soft between my fingers. I was hypnotized. How had I lived all alone for so long? How had I not known what I was missing? As the storm gradually retreated and the night grew darker and quieter, I struggled to keep my eyes open. Maybe I was a little afraid that if I let myself fall asleep, I'd wake up to find this was all the dream, but eventually I fell asleep anyway. Okay, I believe that that scene in the uncensored version was supposed to happen in chapter 6. So I imagine if I went with the other option to tell her how we feel, it would have led to something that I wouldn't be able to show on YouTube. But yeah, so that's the CG. Yeah, I think that's the CG that I won't be able to really show in this playthrough. And, yeah, well, the CG that you can only get if you have the the 18 plus DLC. Chapter 7, Integration. The next morning, I awoke to the sound of rain softly pelting the windows. The storm had passed, leaving only a damp, drizzly day behind. I kept my eyes closed and listened. I could hear the faint sound of the rain dripping from the downspout along the house. I stretched out my arms. The bed around me was empty and cold. Mallory was gone, but I knew she was there because I could still feel her on my skin. The cabin felt extra chilly. I got out of bed and dressed up warm, pulling on a pair of worn-out slippers. I made my way downstairs. Okay, well, at least she's still here. Right away I spotted Mallory in the kitchen, and I felt my face break into a smile. She had a bucket and a bunch of racks out, and she seemed to be cleaning quite furiously with a cloth and a spray bottle in hand. Good morning. She startled upright, fumbling and dropping the spray bottle. It clattered to the floor at her feet. Uh, you scared me! <laughs> sorry, sorry. I guess these slippers add plus one to my sneak ability. <laughs> this is a snake. I'm done here. Otacon, what's going on here? Oh wait, no. Oh dear. Mallory bent to pick up the bottle. When she stood back up, I noticed how red her cheeks were and how the rest of her face looked almost sickly pale. Are you feeling okay? I'm starting to feel like she isn't okay. She quickly averted her gaze. Bit of vertigo, I see. Well, I don't know. I didn't think I really believed her. She was feeling awkward, maybe even hiding something. Had I done something to make her uncomfortable? I don't think so. I looked around at the sparkling kitchen, the cabinets, appliances, and dishes, 
all gleaming like new. You must have woken up really early to get this much work done. Did you get enough sleep? What's that? Oh, yes I did. Huh. Then her face softened and her tone and her tone turned sincere. Man, these tea sounds. I think last night was the best sleep I've ever had. And I imagine had I chosen the other option, and it's a, and if this was the other version of the game, that probably would have been the best night you'd ever had. My heart my heart fluttered with acknowledgement and with the memory of falling asleep with her in my arms. Good. I I agree. I agree with the fish thing! Rest in peace, Gilbert Gottfried. She nodded and turned back to finish up her chores in the kitchen. I decided to check in with work stuff, so I booted up my computer. There were only a handful of emails needing attention. I handled those and glanced through my work deadlines, making sure I was still on track with each of my freelance jobs. For whatever reason, I wasn't finding it easy to focus. I kept glancing out the window, then zoning out as I watched the dribbling rain. It really showed no signs of stopping. I'd noticed an empty glass I'd left on the table outside was filled to the brim with rainwater. The soaked wooden planks of the deck looked dark like caramel. I thought about the coming winter. I'd have to show Mallory how to protect the garden and the hens and the bees when the colder weather came. Wait, there's bees? And then there were all the fun things we could do together. I wondered if she'd ever gone tobogganing before, or had a bonfire out in the snow. If I could find somewhere online to buy marshmallows and order them right away, they might get dropped off sometime in the winter. Oh my god. There came a sudden clatter and a thud from the kitchen. I nearly I jumped, nearly knocking my coffee mug off the desk. Mallory? She didn't answer. I stood up quickly, walking over to see what happened. My throat tightened when I looked past the counter. Oh my... Why do I have to see this? I don't want to see this. Mallory lay sprawled on the floor, her cheeks red and beads of sweat gleaming on her forehead. Her eyes were closed, her head gently lolling to the side. Mallory! I rushed to her side, dropping to my knees and propping her up in my arms. The touch of her skin warmed my hands. She was burning up. A groan left her lips, and her eyes fluttered open. Mallory, are you okay? Hey there. Um, why are we on the floor? Her gaze seemed to drift past me, as though she was having a hard time focusing. You must have fainted. I knew something wasn't right. Why didn't you tell me? I, I'm fine. It was just a sudden dizzy spell. I haven't eaten breakfast, that's probably it. I don't think so. But I could feel her bar I can feel her body starting to tremble. Her skin felt fever hot, and yet there were goosebumps on her arms and legs. So she's having fever and the chills here. Shit. My only instinct now was to make sure she was okay. I lifted her up off the floor. Oh my, what, what are you doing? <gasps> put me down! I quickly carried her over to the couch and put her down there. I covered her in blankets and tucked her in tightly, my face set with grim determination. I brushed her hair back to feel her forehead and ignored the anxious way my stomach clenched. I jerked I darted back into the kitchen, grabbed the temperature scanner from the drawer, and returned to Mallory's side. Honestly, I'm fine. I probably 
just overworked myself. Not buying it. I'm not buying it either. Oh god, that's not a good sound. I held up the scanner. It seemed to take forever and effort to come up with a reading, and when it did, my heart sank. You definitely have a fever. Mallory seemed to shrink under the blankets. Seeing her like this, looking so helpless and uncertain, made my heart feel like it was being painfully squeezed. Is it your leg? Let me look at it. Maybe you've developed an infection. When did you start feeling sick? This morning? We can get your temperature under control with some aspirin, no worries. And then we'll go from there. I didn't know when I had started to pace, but there I was, heading this way and that, making my way over to the kitchen to search for whatever it was that could help her. I filled a glass with water and reached up into my cupboards for the aspirin bottle, grateful to have kept a supply. Except it wasn't there. Or was it? Had I misplaced it? Maybe, maybe Mallory put it away somewhere else by mistake. I brought her a glass of water anyway and used a damp cloth to cool her forehead. I... Shh. Just relax and let me take care of you for a minute, okay? She opened her mouth to argue, probably back down when she saw the look in my eyes. I moved to her feet and pushed back the blankets to expose her injured leg, and I carefully unwrapped the gauze and peeled back the bandages to see what was going on. There was bruising around the wound, and it was still a bit swollen, but then it had only been a few days. The healing process for something like this would take weeks. I should be keeping a closer eye on this. I shook my head. Drink your water, okay? And you should have something to eat. What would you like? I'm not really hungry. I just feel a bit tired. I'm sure I'll feel good as new if I just have a little nap. I'm not sure about that. I let out a concerned sigh, but agreed. After tucking her in a little tighter, I crossed back to the kitchen and stood there aimlessly for a minute or two. I didn't know what to do. Make her a pot of soup, said my brain. Good idea, brain, I thought. Carrots, onions, celery, potatoes. Potatoes? Oh no, of course I don't have potatoes. I muttered to myself as I, as I searched my kitchen for ingredients, then began roughly chopping what I had. There was some rice in the pantry, I knew, and some peas in the freezer. Soon I was tipping my soup ingredients into the, a pot with a shower of salt and dried parsley. I covered all of it with a stock I'd made from kitchen or from chicken bones and veggie scraps, then set it to simmer. When I crept back over to check on Mallory, I found her deeply asleep. I exchanged the damp cloth on her forehead and piled more blankets around her, then just sat and watched her, feeling dismayed. Deep down I knew what this could be, but I didn't want to think about that, and if I did have to think about it, I didn't want to believe it, and if I had every reason to believe it. No. I stood up and returned to the kitchen gave the bubbling soup a stir, and remembered the aspirin. I started searching for it again, checking each of the drawers and cabinets. I searched in the bathroom and in the living room, even getting it on, on my knees to see if it had rolled beneath some furniture. That's when I spotted it, hidden beneath the couch where Mallory was resting. I reached under the couch and grabbed the bottle. A feeling of immense dread began to form within me. She already had some of the aspirin, didn't she? Already I could tell by the wet of the bottle and the silence as I turned it, but I had to see it to believe it. I popped off the cap and looked inside. The bottle was empty, 
At least 20, maybe 30 tablets gone in less than a week. I looked up at Mallory's sleeping face. I jumped at a loud thwack on the window. Irrationally, I wondered if someone had thrown a rock. It was more likely that a bird had flown into the, into the glass, especially considering how clean it had been since Mallory came to stay. I went to the window to check. Sure enough, a large black bird lay dead on the porch. It appeared to have snapped its neck when it hit the window. Fuck. Mallory would hate to see that. I glanced back at her, a little worried I'd wake her up by talking to myself. But even the loud noise of the bird hitting the window hadn't caused her to stir. In that moment, I realized I was still clutching the empty aspirin bottle. I looked down at it. Yeah, so it seems like the whole time she was probably, in a sense, taking as much aspirin as she could. Probably when he wasn't around. And now there isn't any more, and well now it's... It's looking pretty bad. To say the least. She must have been taking them in secret. Now you see. But why? For the pain in her leg? Or for some other ailment? An overwhelming sense of frustration washed over me in that moment, and without thinking, my hand squeezed the bottle so tightly that it broke. I threw the broken bottle in the trash and stormed outside to deal with the dead bird's body. <coughs> it wasn't until the evening that Mallory woke up. She started coughing right away, even as she sat up clutching the blankets to herself, close to herself. Huh? <laughs> what, what time is it? Don't get up, at least not so fast. Let me help you. Yeah, she could still be feeling dizzy. I stood in the kitchen, tending the soup that had been keeping warm for hours. Mallory looked around, groggily, rubbing her eyes. That's not what your body wanted. I'm glad you got some rest anyway. It was clearly much needed. Though I told her not to move yet, she bundled the, b the blankets around her and made her way over to the kitchen. Well, I would comment on how she looks pretty alluring here, but I'm too busy being worried about her to even think too much about that. She leaned against a support beam. Her cheeks were still red, and her eyelids looked heavy. The way she wrapped the blanket around herself made her resemble a colorful turtle with her long, slender arms poking out to hold onto the beam. How do you feel? My muscles are a bit achy, but I don't feel cold anymore. I think all the blankets you piled on top of me helped. I nodded and turned my attention back to the stove. I wanted to ask about the aspirin, but I was nervous. Yeah, I mean... Damn, this is another tough spot. Well, I mean, especially because she's obviously not feeling well, and I mean, I almost feel like saying, now isn't the time to be playing 20 questions with her or whatever. Wait, are you cooking? She took a step forward. She took a step towards me, trying to peer into the pot, then wobbled and had to return to the support beam. It looked as though she barely had any strength to stand. I bit my tongue, not wanting to be overbearing. I'd get her to sit back down by offering her some food. I am. It's ready to eat now. Go have a seat and I'll bring you a bowl. I half expected her to argue, to insist she could get her own bowl or that I should sit while she served me, but instead she just backed away and went to sit at the table. It looks really good. Thank you for making it. 
My pleasure. I bet you thought I had no cooking skills. Well, it's finally my time to shine. Time to shine. <laughs> she laughed half-heartedly. I look forward to seeing what you're capable of, cooking senpai. <laughs> well, she still has that charm and wit about her. She folded her blanket neatly over the chair beside her, then placed her arms on the table to form a pillow for her head. She sat with her head down until I set a bowl of soup beside her. Oh, that looks so wonderful. She leaned over the steaming bowl with her eyes closed, holding back her hair as she breathed in slowly. I use lots of spices. They make all the difference when flavoring a dish. That they do. I gave her a little wink, and she smiled. Bon appetit. <laughs> oh my... See, like, in a way, I can't admire Mallory looking beautiful, because... Look what's happening to her, I don't even know what's happening to her. We both raised steaming spoonfuls of soup, blowing on them softly. Only Mallory's exhalation turned raspy, hitched, and she started to cough. She dropped her soon back into the bowl and held her hand to her throat. She drew a deep breath, looking dismayed. I'm so sorry. Too spicy? No, I, I can't. I don't know why. <laughs> Mally tried her best to stifle the coughs with little success. A nervous laugh came out of my mouth. <sighs> Those autumn allergies are so annoying, am I right? Well, I think you and I both know it's more than that. She didn't answer. She was breathing very slowly and focusing very hard on bringing a spoonful of soup to her mouth. She slurped it and honestly she looked like she wanted to throw up. That bad? No, no, I... <laughs> she was racked with another coughing fit. Her chest seemed to rattle with each breath. I couldn't stand seeing her like this. I went to her, rubbing her back as I pushed a glass of water into her hands. Here, drink some. She nodded and clutched the glass hard, trying her best to drink while her chest heaved. A minute later, after she'd managed to take a few sips, she was able to breathe a little more easily. I'm so <laughs> sorry. I can't seem to <laughs> stop. You don't have to be sorry. There's nothing to feel sorry for. Tears began to roll down her face. They splashed onto the table and into her neglected soup bowl. Oh my... Yeah, she's terrified now. And terrified probably doesn't even begin to feel how she's really feeling. More tears dripped from her eyes. More coughs rattled in her chest. She's terrified. She's devastated. She's probably feeling a lot of things over. You don't have to worry. Everything will be okay. All you need to do is rest and let me take care of you. This will pass. I think I maybe just want to lie down. Okay. I'll help you upstairs to the bed. He'll be extra comfy there. She gave a small nod. Her eyes were puffy and red as she gathered up her blankets in her arms. We head for the stairs. I walked with her, taking the steps one at a time and holding her in case she lost her strength. Her skin felt even hotter, burning me even through her sleeve. She needed a fever reducer, that was certain. I made a mental note to check when the new bottle of aspirin I'd ordered would arrive. Okay, so she, he ordered another bottle. 
Once we made it to the upper floor, Mallory pushed me away and started coughing into her blankets, doubling over and trying to muffle the sound of her pain. I unfurled the bed covers and helped her climb in, straightening out her collection of blankets and pulling all the covers up over her. All these blankets are so, so heavy. <laughs> I can barely move. Good. That means you're tucked in safe and sound. I brushed her hair back, tracing the side of her burning face with my fingertips. I'm going to get you some water and things, and then I'll be back, okay? I hurried back downstairs and started loading up a tray with water, a few damp face cloths, and her uneaten bowl of soup. I wanted her to have it right there beside her the minute she had an appetite. But of course that wouldn't be enough. I racked my brain for anything I had in the house to help her to help drive down her fever. Then it hit me. My mother used to talk about the healing properties of basil and garlic. Or basil and garlic. I couldn't quite recall the specifics, but it was something. And I had both of those items growing in my home. I rushed over to the kitchen to fill the kettle with water. While that was coming up to boil, I darted to the aquaponics room. There were four medium-sized basil plants sitting happily under their grow lights, waiting for me to harvest their emerald petals. In that moment, my heart inflated twice its size, full of joy that I might be able to do something to help soothe Mallory's pain. I plucked a handful of leaves from all the basil plants which were different strains, but I didn't think it would matter. Next, I dug out some garlic and extracted a homemade jar of honey that was sitting on the back shelf. I looked around at all the plants and, the, and fish. I did one last scan in case there was anything else I could use. On impulse, I sprouted a bit of a typo there. I spotted a bright red hibiscus flower in, the, in bloom and plucked it. The lone flower had an unusually bright color amongst all the other dark leafy greens. Dashing back into the kitchen, I added the garlic, basil, and honey to the boiling water. The concoction probably wouldn't taste very good, but I hoped it would soothe her throat and help with her cough. Well, I know honey is supposed to help soothe your throat, and I guess in turn your cough. But I mean, that's all I know. At least, judging from this concoction here. Delicately, I placed the flower on the tray, along with a mug of freshly brewed tea. The smell was... overpowering. Maybe she wouldn't be able to smell it. Ascending the stairs, I could hear Mallory coughing. She wasn't trying to stifle it anymore. Uh. I paused on the steps, waiting for her to finish letting it out. A small groan followed the coughing fit. I climbed the rest of the way up the stairs, plastering what I hoped was an optimistic expression on my face. Hey, I'm back. And I brought you your soup, in case you have an appetite. Also, some tea that should help with that cough. Tea, air quotes. She pulled back, or she pulled up the covers close to her face in a poor attempt to hide herself. I rested the tray next to the bed and placed one of the damp cloths on her forehead. Man. In the dim light of the bedside lamp, I could see trickles of sweat on her face, neck, and breasts. Because he loves you. Please, it doesn't feel like enough. Isn't there anything else I can get for you? Her expression turned into a perplexed one for a moment. Then she forced a little smile. Well, now that you mention it, I could use some tissues. Ah, right. I've got some in this drawer here. Ta-da! 
She took the packet of tissues and turned her face away, coughing a wet, guttural cough. Why are you so determined to take care of me? Because he loves you! Her gaze was filled with hope and confusion. I took her hand in mine and gave it a small squeeze. You would do the same for me, wouldn't you? Her lips parted and eyes opened wide. She gave me a soundless nod of reassurance. It's a no-brainer. I care about you and want you to feel better. It's as simple as that. And I almost wonder how this would have been if I did have him confess to her. Yeah, now I'm really thinking here, like, would the same events be going on, or would something else have happened? Something tells me that all of this would still happen, but there might have been, like, little nuances and dialogue here and there. There was a long silence between us then, exchanging our knowing looks with gentle hand squeezes. I thought about the aspirin, the twenty or thirty pills that had disappeared in the space of a few days. And if she was, like, taking that many pills within just a short amount of time, that definitely can't be good for you. Hey, I found the aspirin bottle, by the way. <laughs> well... She gasped, pulling back her hand from mine to cover her face. Yeah, you should have. Was it for your leg? To stop it hurting? Or did you. Did you know you were developing a fever? Moment of truth time. You know what? It doesn't matter. I placed an order for more. It should be here tomorrow or the next day, I think. Okay, well, never mind. I have a feeling, though, that tomorrow, even then, would still be too late. I want you to know that I'm grateful to have you here, and I care about you very much. Parting her fingers to let her eyes peek through, she slowly lowered her defenses. Never really seen this spelling before. I don't want to be sick. Well, no one wants to be sick. My mom definitely didn't want to be sick. I know. I don't want you to get sick. I'm not worried about that. You can't be near me. You need to stay away. I'm... I stretched out next to her on the bed, my face resting close to hers. I'm staying right here, by your side, no matter what. She turned to look at the tray of soup with the water and tea beside it. What a pretty flower. Where did it come from? She reached over to gently pick up the scarlet blossom. From my fish garden, or whatever you called it. <laughs> it must have opened up today. I don't remember seeing it when I fed the fish yesterday. hibiscus. They only bloom for a short while, so we're lucky we got to see it. Hmm. I wasn't sure about that. Interesting. She lay there with her eyes closed, with the flower pressed to her nose. The petals make a wonderful tea. I'll make you some with the other blossoms, if you like. Mallory opened her eyes, but she didn't look at me. She was staring into space, deep in thought. What is it? Oh, nothing. The rain sounds nice. I think it's making me sleepy. I didn't quite believe that. It seemed like there were, was something she didn't want to say. Unfortunately, it seems like she, she's had a lot of secrets that she's kept guarded. I couldn't push her now. Yeah, now isn't the time for that. That's 
It's perfectly all right. You have sweet dreams now. Good night. Good night. I lay there watching her breathe, counting the minutes between each coughing fit, resting my hand on her burning chest so I could feel her heartbeat. I had been somewhere like this before. My parents. Man, so... I guess in a sense he was forced to watch his parents literally die. And well, I was forced to watch my mom die. And it sucks because you feel so damn powerless and you want to do something but you don't know what. I tried my best to care for them when they were sick. I had been so afraid, but I hadn't gotten sick. A part of me almost wondered, even hoped, that I might be immune. That thought in the back of my mind had eased my fear of strangers. Of Mallory when she first appeared in my life. But now? Now, I didn't care. Either way, all I wanted was for her to get better. Eventually, I drifted off to sleep, too. Chapter 8, Infection Achievement unlocked 104 degrees. Okay, well, last chapter of the game. I guess we're going to be getting an ending now. I know it's a bad ending, but even still... I just don't know how bad it's going to be. In the dead of night, something woke me up. The sound of the wind, an animal, whatever it was, it pulled me out of some dream. I sat up and listened. The night was quiet now, nothing but, cr nothing but crickets and white noise. I realized I really needed to pee. Carefully, as to not wake Mallory, I got out of bed. I headed downstairs to the bathroom, half asleep in the dark. Once I was done, I went to the kitchen for some water. I stood by the window with my glass, looking out at the sleeping world. I wasn't used to being awake at this hour. It was a little eerie. I glanced up at the dark loft where Mallory slept. For a while, her caffeine had her coughing had kept her and me awake, but I'd rubbed her back until we both drifted off. Thankfully, she was sleeping peacefully now, getting the rest she needed. Worry made my stomach feel sick and my chest feel hollow. There's no way I'm getting back to sleep now. I would have been amazed if you could even sleep after all this. I paced back and forth for a minute, dragging my hands through my face. I needed a distraction, something to shut down my brain, or at least get rid of this nervous energy. Shaking my head, I went to my desk and dropped it to my chair. Computers were, were usually pretty distracting. I turned on the monitor and pulled out my keyboard. It was a membrane keyboard, so I wouldn't have to worry about making too much noise with my typing. Huh. Maybe I should look into getting one of those someday. There were more emails waiting in my inbox. One was from a colleague who worked out of Vietnam. The time difference would have meant it was late in the afternoon over there, so she was probably wrapping up her work day as I sat there in the darkest hour of night. The subject... What? The subject line read, Remedy Distribution Underway. Just reading it made my blood boil. I was so sick of these empty promises, and for what? <sighs> okay, well... Let me see here. Okay, well, this is... In this case, considering in the off chance that there is something, like, I hate this, I really do, but 
we are going to see what happens if I just delete the spam. And the off chance that this is actually like the real deal, and I have basically just screwed us over to get possibly one of the worst endings I could possibly be going for here. Ugh. I dragged the email to the trash bin and then emptied the trash bin for good measure. Then I shot to my feet, shoving my chair back aggressively. I hadn't even known how angry and helpless it felt until that moment. Or I felt. I looked outside again. It had stopped raining, but there were streaks of water on the windows. It looked like the cabin was crying. What would I do if Mallory didn't pull through this? If it really was the virus making her sick, the chances of her getting better were... I couldn't even finish the thought. I took a deep, trembling breath. Maybe some fresh air would help. Fresh air always helped. I turned and looked around for my jacket. Instead, the watery eyes... Instead, my watery eyes caught sight of something resting on the table. Oh my god, please don't tell me this is gonna be like some kind of your lie in April sort of heartbreak here. It was a small notebook left open. I crept over to it, picked it up, and looked at what was written on the page. A lump formed in my throat and my stomach twisted. We both know I have it. My only hope is that it's not too late. That I haven't passed it to you. Because I want you to carry on with your life. Don't worry about me. I'm going back home to find out what happened to my sister. Whatever the answer is, I'm comforted to know we'll see each other again soon. I hope you know I would have stayed with you forever. But I'm thankful we had the time that we did. Love, Mallory. I stared at the letter. No. I had... I had only just been laying in bed next to her. I scanned the letter from top to bottom, again and again, then heard my voice ringing out. Mallory? The cabin remained silent. My face felt cold. The paper rattled in my trembling hand as I crossed to the base of the stairs. Mallory? Please say something. Still no reply. This had to be a dream. Just a terrible dream brought on by stress. I'd definitely been stressed the past couple of days, hadn't I? One step at a time, I climbed upstairs. Of course she would be there, sleeping soundly under all those heavy blankets. I would have noticed if she wasn't there when I got up, wouldn't I? I reached the loft, which didn't seem nearly as pitch black now that my eyes had adjusted to the darkness. I looked at the bed. Mallory was gone. I knew it wasn't a dream then. She had really left. And I had slept through it. I crumpled the paper in my hand, forming a tight fist. In that moment, I was ready to put a hole through my wall. My heart was racing. I couldn't think straight. Damn it! I had to go after her. She couldn't have made it far, not with her leg and how sick she was. She was deter I was determined to find her, convince her to come back, convince her that we could be together, whatever the circumstances. She needed to know how I felt about her, how much she meant to me. I raced to get dressed, throwing on a sweater and the first pair of pants I found, shoving my feet into some shoes and grabbing the crank-powered flashlight off the, ta the side table. There wasn't time to think. I just had to move. I burst through the front door and onto the porch, nearly tripping down the steps before racing across the muddy lawn, my feet splashing in puddles. It wasn't long before I passed the garden over the hill, heading towards the trees. 
as I made my way. I shoved my hand into the sweater pocket and pulled out the flashlight, the same one that had led me to Mallory that first night. I immediately started cranking it, hoping against hope it would lead me to her again. But as I entered the trees, I stopped, hesitating. Mallory's note said she was heading back to the city to check on her sister. Most likely, she'd taken the footpath through the woods, the path she'd taken to get here in the first place. I might be able to catch up to her if I followed, but it depended on how much of a head start she had. If I followed the old driveway instead, I'd eventually make it to the highway. It was a longer path, but a more straightforward one. And if I could manage to flag down a car and get a ride, then I might even reach the city before Mallory did. But what are the odds of that? I had to pick quickly. Oh my... You're still gonna do this to me! Okay, let me see here. Shit. Okay, well, I guess in this case... Um, okay, there we go. So some of these I'm probably just going to go back and see if there are any little nuances here and there, just before. Well, in my mind, this is the worst option, so that's what we're going for. Both options seemed so risky. I took my chances and started down the highway, toward the main road. I ran as fast as I could. The light from the flashlight bobbed and bounced ahead of me, lighting up potholes and stones for me to dart around and over. Within minutes, I was at the turn where the driveway met the main road, where high mass lights towered over me. The road itself was desolate. Of course, few people traveled anymore. Still, as I jogged along the shoulder in the direction of the city, I kept cranking my flashlight, swinging it back and forth on the off chance that someone, anyone, might come along and see me. A stitch began to form in my side, making each footfall painful. I pushed through it for Mallory. Please, is anyone out there? My adrenaline had worn off, and now there was a hollowness in me. But then, as if my desperate voice had summoned it, a car appeared in the distance. I heard it before I saw it, and when I saw it, I started waving my arms, frantic once more. Stay away from each other, said my brain. Shut up! That's not important right now! The car was getting closer, its headlights glaring. I jumped up and down and waved the flashlight, calling out. Stop! Please! Stop! I need help! The car began to slow. I hurried towards it, believing it was com about to come to a stop. But after a brief hesitation, the car sailed past, picking up speed and leaving me to watch its, hail light its tail lights fade. I fell to my knees, exhausted, hopeless. Then, once I'd caught my breath, I got up and started jogging again. Well, we found a car, but it seemed like they didn't want to stop for us. They were probably also thinking to stay away from each other and all that jazz, too. Keep going. For Mallory, just keep going. It wasn't too long before I heard the hum of another vehicle coming down the road. I waved my flashlight back and forth again. Once again. Maybe this time? Well. <laughs> to my amazement, the car actually slowed to a stop, honking as I did. It had one of those cheery, ridiculous musical horns. The kind that plays La Cucaracha, La Cucaracha. Oh, thank you. Finally. I stopped, leaning on my knees to catch my breath. The driver of the car reached over and rolled the window down, revealing themselves to be a sweet-looking old lady with a bottle-thick glasses perched on her nose. <laughs> she almost sounds like what my mom would call... A little old lady from Pasadena. Hello, dear. How can I help you? Okay, thank goodness everyone is voiced in this game. I mean, I could probably do an old lady voice, but still. 
Hello, dear. How can I help you? Okay, actually, I... Hello, dear. How can I help you? Well, whatever. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get to the city. Could I... Could I maybe have a ride? I promise I'm not sick. I... I... I couldn't believe I was saying this, even though I didn't know. I could have caught the virus from Mallory easily. I could be a carrier. I could spread it. I could... Goodness me! I'm not worried about that. Climb in, dear. We're in for a very bumpy ride! Well, who knows? Maybe I did pick a good ending. Sort of. I don't know. Relief flooded me. I climbed into the car, which smelled like toffee and knitting, and pulled the door shut behind me. The sweet old lady in her floral dress leaned forward over her steering wheel, and we carried on down the highway. Okay, little old lady from Pasadena, let's go! So tell me, dear, what's got a nice young thing like you in such a tizzy? The woman that I love is walked out of my life, and I need to go find her because she's possibly going to die if I don't do anything. It's... it's my friend. She's in the city, and she's... she's sick. I need to get to her. I just... I just can't lose her to this damn virus. Oh, well, it's not a virus. You know that, don't you, dear? What? I looked at her, confused. Sorry? It's not a virus, it's an allergy. I'm sorry, what? What are you talking about, sweet old lady? It's an allergy? Does a sharply dressed bear poop in the woods? Yes, it's an allergy, sure as the earth is flat. Of course she's one of those people! And well, I guess that's a reference to Beverly, but... Oh my god! The... what? Wait, you think the Earth is flat? Yes, apparently she's a flat earther. Getting flatter every day, dear. Oh my god! I myself have quite a rash from all the flattening. I don't even want to know what you're thinking. I stood at the road straight ahead. Just ignore it, you'll live longer. Possibly, I don't know. Okay, just ignore her. In a few more minutes, you'll reach the city. That's what's important. And speaking of, dear, do you know what rhymes with flat earth? Cat earth. That's right. The cats have known all along. Oh my god. I feel like she... I feel like she's one of those people who would kind of wear like one of those aluminum foil hats. <laughs> Good point. You can just drop me off near the hospital and I'll go from there. Yes, and if you keep talking, I'll just... Don't mind me, I'm just gonna smile and nod. I'm actually listening to you, even though I'm actually not. We're getting close, right? Heavens to Betsy! You don't expect me to drive on the main roads, do you? Why not? She looked appalled that I would even ask such a question, and I was getting frustrated. You realize we're on a main road now, right? What? The old lady gasped, slamming the brakes and spinning the steering wheel left towards the trees. Oh, right. So now it's time for you to sit down, shut up, and HOLD ON TO YOUR SEATS! I shouted. We were suddenly careening across the shallow ditch in the woods, and the old woman kept jerking the wheel back and forth as she pressed the pedal closer to the metal. Stop! Stop! Well then. Okay, maybe I didn't choose a good ending. We hit something hard. I felt it rattle up through me from beneath the car, and then seconds later came the crunching impact of the crash. In terrifying slow motion, I saw the ho I saw the hood and windshield buckle and crumple towards me. 
There is only darkness and the broken, sputtering sound of that ridiculous musical horn going off. What a stupid way to go, I thought. Cat Earth Theory. What is this? What is this music? <laughs> this totally doesn't match the tone right now. Oh my god. Plague City. Oh, oh, well, actually, yeah, no, I don't want to quit the game. Okay, let's go backwards, then. Okay, then. I'll look at the endings after this, possibly. Okay, we're gonna go through the trees, or actually, hold on, I already forgot, was there a, ah, screw it, let's just go through the trees, both options seemed risky, both options seemed so risky, I took my chances and started down the footpath into the woods. As I ran, I ran as fast as I could over the uneven ground. The beam from my flashlight bounced and shook, hardly making it any easier to see. Branches whipped me and roots tipped, tripped me, and I couldn't make myself stop or slow down. Mallory! Mallory! I didn't know where I was. I couldn't see anything. I just kept running, panting hard, every breath a stabbing pain. My foot caught something, a root or a rock. I pitched forwards, momentum throwing me head over heels, and not in the good way. My flashlight went flying off into the bushes somewhere. Instead of slamming into the ground, I just seemed to keep falling. I fell for hours. Oh shit. I didn't feel the impact. I came to a sprawled across a bed of snapped branches, rocks, in hard-packed earth, water trickled somewhere nearby, a stream or a brook. The sky was still dark and everything hurt. I tried to move. Pain stopped me. Something was definitely broken. I managed to crane my neck, blinking my eyes open as wide as I could. The forest sloped up and up overhead. A dissing sight, like an optical illusion. Oh no. No. I had fallen. Fallen, fallen, fallen into a dark ravine. That's what you get for sprinting through a dark forest all willy-nilly. Tears clouded my vision. Shut up, brain! Hillary. I tried to move again. I tried harder. I couldn't get up, but my leg twitched and I noticed a rip in my pant leg. These were the same pants I'd been wearing the night I met Mallory. I had torn them from coming into the cabin. That tear had been fixed with a heart patch. I remember Mallory taking that box of clothes and seeing her later with a needle and thread as she worked to stitch up the rips and fasten buttons. lovingly patched. But she hadn't just mended these pants, she embroidered them, left a sweet token of herself and her ability to love and care for others. My heart swelled and ached, and all I wanted to do was cry. Why did this have to happen? Why did I have to lose everyone I dared to love? My head was spinning, spinning so fast. I, I felt like I couldn't keep my eyes open. I felt like maybe I would die here. 
I came to understand that I had no hope of, ca of reaching Mallory. Laying cold and broken at the bottom of a forest ravine, I cried. I'm sorry, Mallory. I'm so, so sorry. All I had now were thoughts of her. And what would become of us? Maybe I'll see her again. I'll become a ghost or something. But what if I can only haunt this specific forest ravine? Damn. <laughs> well then. This music sounds so corny and upbeat for what we're going through right now. And confirmed, we are Marshmallow. Okay. So those are both those options out of the way. Okay, we're gonna... I think I might just call this here. Just because... Yeah, I don't know how much more we could branch off. Okay, yeah, looks like we still have some different things here we could do. So... Yeah, so we have this whole page filled up. We're still missing some CGs here, so... I'm pretty sure that we could have gotten some different results. And then, as I mentioned, moving the bear trap is one of the key things to getting the bad endings, from what I understood. So, there is that. And then, yeah, some of the first set of bad endings here. <laughs> I don't believe it, though. Okay, well, in that case... Yeah, so... I guess for the time being, I might continue from certain points, and then we'll just see where I can go from there. I, mean, I think one of the obvious ones would be like with the messages, or the message about the cure being distributed. But anyway, so I think. I don't know if these count as bad endings or not. I might have to look into that a little more. Find that guide again and see. Maybe even take note of what choices I do have to make in order to make... make clear the path I'm going for whatever endings that there are. We'll see. But anyway, so thank you all for watching and I'll see you guys next time with whatever else I do. Stay golden and later, folks.